بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Brothers and sisters, of course, we're going to talk about Ramadan reminders and insha'Allah ta'ala, I'm going to leave a lot of space for you to ask questions. So I'm just going to do some reminders of Ramadan main points so we can get into the spirit insha'Allah. First and foremost, I want to start by explaining what is the purpose of fasting Ramadan. And as an introduction, I'm going to speak about three purposes. Two of them are spiritual, and one of them is worldly. So the first purpose why we fast Ramadan, why we fast as Muslims, has got to do with taqwa, in order to increase our spirituality, our connection with Allah. Our taqwa means protection, protecting yourself from everything that is wrong and displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and finding a closeness to Him in your soul, in your spirit, in your nafs, in your heart. So the first thing and the most important thing is spiritual increase. The second reason we fast Ramadan is that it is a school each year to remind us about improving our character, strengthening our control over following our desires and temptations. And that is why the Prophet وسلم, he said, I can guarantee a place in the heart of paradise for those who have excelled in their good character. And the third reason we fast is also a benefit, but it's a worldly benefit, which is health and benefit to your health. The benefit of the health is not the primary goal. Because you can do a whole lot of things that are good for your health. But your intention should not be fasting for health reasons. That's wrong. We fast because of spiritual reasons, because of our character and improving ourselves and working for our hereafter. But there is nothing which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to do or prohibits us from doing, except that it always has a benefit for us in this world as well in our livelihood, in everything about our life, our well-being, our welfare, our physical, mental, and uh, spiritual benefit, insha'Allah ta'ala. So let us begin, insha'Allah, with the first aspect. You all know the verse in the Qur'an, in Surah Al-Baqarah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامُ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ O you who have believed, fasting has been prescribed upon you as it was prescribed on those communities before you, in order or in the hope that you may receive or attain piety, righteousness, closeness to Allah, fear of God, in order to attain that, in the hope of attaining that. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in other verses, telling us that they are numbered days, ayyaman ma'dudat, they're just a few days. Allah does never, never commands us to do something that is harmful to us. And people sometimes associate fasting with harm, because we need nutrients. But Allah who created this human being knows not to command us to do something that is directly harmful to us. That is why Allah also says in the Quran, فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرٍ An exemption. As for those among you who is sick in the time of fasting Ramadan, if you're sick, you've got a virus, you've got a bacterial infection, you get to a state where you are truly and honestly fatigued to the point where you can no longer function. You're, you, 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 you're vomiting, you're uh, losing consciousness and awareness. This is a sickness. Allah says, if you are in a state of sickness or you are on a travel, if you are on safar, a travel, the unanimous agreement by all the schools of thought is estimated in kilometers today about 80 kilometers out and your intention should be for safar so you are traveling 
So it's not for a person who has a daily trip because of their work every day going and coming back, but you have gone as a, a casual or a, not a casual sort of a, a, a specific designation to go on safar. You have to go somewhere far once or twice, then you can break your fast. Even if you do safar throughout Ramadan, you can actually break your fast throughout Ramadan if you're on a designated travel and it's not a regular daily habit. But in general, you all understand, if you are sick and on a travel, then you can make up other days instead of this one. Make up the days, you're not exempt from them. And then another verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also talks about people who are old in age or fragile or frail. He doesn't say subhanahu wa ta'ala, the elderly or the elderly citizens. He says, Those who are not able to do it, they have a situation. And this covers all types of people who are fragile, frail, weak. So weakness because of a, a, a disability, a disease that they have, a chronic health condition. Chronic means long-term health condition as opposed to acute Acute health condition means temporary. Chronic means you have a long-term health problem such as uh, severe diabetes or some other type of diseases or sicknesses that will definitely harm you if you fasted. Elderly person who is very old where his body is very weak or his, her body is very weak and they have multiple problems where they need their medication, they need to be hydrated, they need to eat and usually we know this from medical advice. You go to a doctor, professional, you don't go to a sheikh or an imam. A sheikh and imam will tell you, what did the doctor say? And based on that, we say, break or continue. So some people go to sheikhs for all sorts of things. They even go to ask about electricity bills. <laughs> sheikhs don't know everything. You've got to go to the person of the knowledge. فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ And ask those endued with the right knowledge of the question that you're asking if you yourself do not know. So brothers and sisters, Allah says then finally, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرَ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرَ It is because Allah wants ease for you, He does not want hardship for you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what harms you and what doesn't. So don't you go and put pressure on yourself that is uncalled for. I make this point deliberately because some Muslims, mashaAllah, they love to get closer to Allah and really are diligent on pleasing Allah. However, that diligence, brothers and sisters, can be to an extreme, to the right or extreme to the left. Some people are so diligent on their acts of worship that they exhaust themselves and they go beyond what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exempted them to do and they want to be extra worshipping of Allah and so the shaitan sometimes comes that way and makes you fear hellfire, fear forgiveness of Allah, fear his mercy, fear all these things to the point where you start putting too many restrictions on yourself when it was never meant to be. A lot of Muslims do that and their piety then makes them become exhausted and some of them even stop. Some of them, they say, what's the point anymore? Because they exhausted themselves. And then there are others who neglect completely. They take things way too easy and they don't care about asking what breaks my fast, what doesn't, what brings me close to Allah, whatever. I'll just do things and go with the flow. That is also sinful and a Muslim should not remain like that. You should always try your best to know at least the fundamentals. So a Muslim is balanced and within the boundaries of the deen. So Allah says, Allah wants ease for you, He does not want hardship for you. And so that He can bestow His blessing upon you. The whole purpose of why He told you to pray and fast is not to cause hardship and pain for you and hunger or thirst, but it is in order to perfect or complete His blessing upon you. What is the blessing? It is the purpose of fasting, the purpose of salah, the spirituality behind it, the purpose behind it. And that is why I'm going to quote to you this amazing, beautiful hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu He said, "Man lam yada' qawl al-zuri wal-amali wal-amali bil." Whoever in during fasting of Ramadan does not abstain from lying, from perpetrating and deceiving, from uh, deception, fraudulent talk and fraudulent behavior, lying behavior, meaning hypocrisy, and from acting upon it, right? And also sinful behavior. Then Allah has no business in just making you 
get hungry and thirsty. What's the point? What is the point? So, brothers and sisters, this hadith is actually in Sahih Bukhari. Whoever does not give up false statements, telling lies, and evil deeds, and speaking bad words to others, Allah is not in need of his fasting, leaving his food and drink. What's the point? So the purpose of that is something else. The purpose is not to endure pain of hunger and thirst, but to raise your character during that time. It's like when you go to the gym and you do resistance exercise. You shock your muscle. Those of you who know how to build muscle, or you want to lose weight, you know how to shock your body's uh, reaction. And so the body starts seeing benefit and you start seeing results. But when you think about beyond the pain, you endure. People don't go to do exercise because it makes them tired and pain and bring them pain. No, they do it because the results that they're going to get out of it. That's why you have so many mirrors. Everybody's looking at themselves. They want to see the results. Same with the fasting. Think about the results. And that's why Rasul also said, من صام رمضان إيمانا واحتسابا غفر له ما تقدم من ذنبه in Bukhari and Muslim he said whoever fasts Ramadan with two goals in mind number one truly believing with his full hearted faith in Allah in that fasting is truly from Allah fasting is truly part of faith fasting is truly a spiritual act and command believing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala truly would not tell you that without a benefit to you and that it is it wards off harm from you and believing that fasting is a pillar of Islam believing that fasting will bring you closer to Jannah and away from hellfire that's called the Iman you must go into it believing that وَاحْتِسَابًا and also the second goal is looking forward to the rewards and results from it what is the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in the hereafter and in this world. Ihtisab. What makes a person endure when you think about what's going to come out of it? What is the result of it all? And just a very simple statement. That's why the scholars used to say, a mu'min lives his, his or her life as if they are in the hereafter. Always imagine yourself, you are on the day of judgment, if you believe in it, right? And this is, this is why it's only for people who believe. These people who don't believe in the deen and Qur'an, they're not going to see that. They're going to say, what's this nonsense? Because they're thinking in terms of the narrow, temporary boundaries of this life which they see, and that's it. There's nothing beyond it. Well, if you don't think anything beyond it, you don't believe in it, just, you know, don't even listen to these people. These people are not thinking beyond that. They're just thinking about the health benefit. Uh, is it beneficial? Let's look at the articles. Let's look at the studies. That's what the doctor said, and I'll go by that. Let's look if it really does help me with my anger, if it doesn't. And that is why with faith and belief, your fasting becomes something different. A lot of people who tell me that they're going to convert or, if you like the word, revert to Islam. Before they do it, they're always asking about you know, fasting in Ramadan. And mashallah, some of them are so prepared. And some of them try to fast before they embrace Islam. They want to try it out. But you see, it's good to, to, to practice from a physical point of view. But it is never ever the same. Once you embrace Islam, say your shahada, and your full belief is intact, and you're convinced with it, and you're with it, fasting suddenly takes on another whole new world for you. Everything about good deeds, your, your salat is for a different reason, your fasting, your hajj, everything means differently now. And really, those who convert to Islam really know exactly what I mean. Ask them, they will teach us a thing or two about how the heart changes. Or somebody who's had a bad life before, a sinful life, and suddenly they've repented to Allah. Suddenly fasting and salat takes on a different meaning to them. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm sure a lot of us have been through that. What does Rasul say? He says, whoever fasts Ramadan out of pure faith and belief, proper one, and anticipation for the reward which they believe in, all of their sins which they have done to this point will be forgiven. All of them will be forgiven. Which type of sins? They're all the minor sins. As for the major sins, they require uh, exclusive repentance. You have to stop the major sins. Which, well, I had a talk about this last time, a lecture. It's on YouTube, my YouTube page. It's got um, the, uh, about major sins and minor sins. Or any other page that, alhamdulillah, you trust qualified scholar to talk about it, then go for it. So brothers and sisters, 
So therefore, what are the conditions of the promised forgiveness from Allah to get the full reward and to be forgiven in Ramadan? Number one, your faith. Number two, sincerity, seeking Allah's pleasure and rewards. If you're not sincere, you're not going to be anticipating the rewards. You're going to say, what's that for? All I get is hunger and tiredness. And number three, avoiding major sins. Three conditions. Who can say them to me? First condition, to re receive the forgiveness and the full reward of fasting. Number one, clear faith. Number two, sincerity, anticipating the reward from Allah. Because if you, if you don't believe in the hereafter, you're not going to have sincerity. And number three, avoiding, avoiding major sins. Avoid, do these three and avoid the major sins in Ramadan and you will be insha'Allah among those who goes under the, you'll be a candidate, all right, to receive Allah's forgiveness and the reward. What about the minor sins? The minor sins get washed away. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, your five daily prayers from prayer to prayer, and your Jumu'ah, Friday to Friday, and Ramadan to Ramadan, are expiators. They wash away all the sins, the minor sins, that occurred in between them. On condition that you avoid the major sins. The hadith is in Sahih Muslim. However, the minor sins, we have to work on them. Rasul Sallallahu describes some of the minor sins. He says, you know how he says, a man or even a woman, because whenever we say man, it means woman as well, who in their family, they say words they shouldn't have said. They acted in certain ways towards their husband or their wife or their children or their parents. They shouldn't have said minor things that are temporary. Or they said something they shouldn't have said to their neighbor or they harmed their neighbor in some way, which is minor. Examples like that, he said, the prayers and the fasting and your sadaqah, the charity that you give, wipes them away. They are things that don't stay for long. As for major things, stealing theft, drinking alcohol, drugs, zina, adultery, fornication, riba, usury, usury from the banks, interest. We're not talking about people who are in a severe case of necessity, by the way. We're talking about people who casually just take it without no care. That's another topic. Or people who uh, accuse others of heinous crimes, putting their life in turmoil. These are all signs. These are major sins which a person needs to repent from. Moving on, brothers and sisters. A lot of people ask me, in Ramadan, fasting, are the good deeds multiplied? So instead of one in Ramadan, is it like a thousand? So let's say I tell the truth. Allah gives you a good deed. Does that mean in Ramadan, I get a thousand good deeds, for example? If I pray Salat, Dhuhr, in Ramadan, if I pray Salat Dhuhr, that same Salat, if it is equal to 27, is it now equal to 207? What, what does it mean? The answer to that, brothers and sisters, is this. Throughout the entire year, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always multiplies in number your good deeds. You can do it any, any time of the year, not just in Ramadan. Whether in Ramadan or outside of Ramadan, Allah looks at your intentions, looks at your sincerity, looks at how well you performed that good deed. And He will give each individual based on what they deserve and multiply it. So it could be for me, that one salat I did yesterday could equal a hundred. For the brother over here, that same salat could equal a thousand. Allah looks into our hearts and how well we did it and he multiplies for people differently. Could be a small deed that I do. Sorry, it could be a big deed that I do and a small deed this brother does. My big deed will equal to his small deed based on his intention and his, how he did it and uh, his anticipation of Allah's reward and so on on many factors. Same with Ramadan. The good deeds do not automatically get multiplied in number. Because there is no, there's actually no uh, text in the Qur'an and Sharia which, which tells you that. But I'll tell you what does happen in Ramadan. In Ramadan, definitely, the texts show us that the good deed is more weighty. It's heavier. It means a lot more to Allah. It means a lot more. 
So it's like looking at currencies. Let's, let's talk about in the way that we can understand it. Some currencies, you can have a, a million of it. But because of the country's economic s situation, that million could equal in Australian dollars what? A dollar. Or you can have a euro, and in that same country, one euro equals 10 million of that currency. So the weight of what that means. That's the same in Ramadan. If you think of it in currency-wise, it's not more, but it's worth more. Same as when you do a good deed in Hajj or in Masjid al-Nabawi, you pray that your deed is worth more. So now we are established. The good deeds are multiplied depending on your intention, not just because of the fact it's Ramadan. Not because of the fact that it's Ramadan. You could do a good deed and not really, you're not, you're not really looking forward to Ramadan. You're not really anticipating the reward in Iman. That good deed means it doesn't really have much weight. So if the good deeds are more serious and weighty and have more value, then the sins also are more serious. Did you know there are people who enter Ramadan and exit Ramadan and their entire sins are forgiven and their iman is higher and the value of their deeds is heavier than the mountains and the skies put together. And some of them, they enter Ramadan and guess what happens to them? It becomes a cause for them to enter hellfire or get closer to hellfire. You either go this way or that way. Which one do you want? It's a pathway for both. Some people use Ramadan and they do every major sin and they waste their time and they go and do all sorts of terrible things, especially after Taraweeh, they think they can let their hair down and they spend it in places that earn them more haram and more sins. You think to yourself, well, what has this person really done for his Ramadan or her Ramadan? Also, the good deeds, uh, also the sins are not multiplied any time during the year. So the sins are not multiplied, the good deeds are not multiplied. The good deeds are heavier in value and the sins are heavier in seriousness. Let's look at some virtues. The Prophet ﷺ was the most giving in Ramadan. And giving does not only mean money. Giving means from anything of yourself. Your time, your goodness, your kindness, your care, your forgiveness, your mercy, your service, your smile, your attention to someone, your bringing of happiness to someone, helping someone relieve their pain, their worries, their stress, being there for someone. Uh, sharing food, sharing goodness. You lend someone money, they're in strife. They say, please give me more time. You give them more time. All this is called giving. Also in worship, you do more salat, you do more Quran, you do more dhikr, you do more sadaqah, you do more dua. All of this is called giving. Rasul can ajwada, ajwadu ma yak, ajwada ma, ajwadu ma yakun fi Ramadan. Aisha and the rest of the companions is to say, Rasulullah was the most giving in Ramadan. This is now what giving means. Not just money, all of it, what I just mentioned. So that means everyone has an opportunity to give, whether you are rich or poor, strong or weak, uh, in authority or not, everybody has a way of giving. And there are five main activities of worship in Ramadan that we do. Five. You can do more, but these are the minimum. You ready for them? Number one. Extra prayers. You might be just doing the five compulsory prayers right now. Why don't you go and add the sunnas? There are 12 sunnas in the day that are unanimously agreed upon. If you follow a particular school of thought, the Hanafi, then there's also another four in their opinion. Doesn't matter. Four after, uh, before Asr, they say. So the sunnas are two before Fajr, four before Dhuhr, two after Dhuhr, two after Maghrib, Two after Aisha. How many is that? Twelve. And four before, before the Asr is voluntary, at least. Add some voluntary Salat. There is the Duha Salat. The Duha Salat, who knows where it's from? When is Duha Salat? From when to when? Anyone know? When is Duha Salat? Sunrise? Okay, it's called Duha, dawn. But when is it from? About 15 minutes after sunrise, yep, till about about 10, 10 or 15 minutes before Dhuhr. That's correct. But all this time, we once did Atikaf and my friend said to me after Fajr and the sun had risen, he says, 
have you given sadaqa on behalf of all your joints of your body? I said, what? She said, there's 360 something joints in my body that I give sadaqa. And then I remembered, he goes, ah, your duha, have you prayed your duha? Because the Prophet ﷺ said every day a person should give a sadaqa, a good deed on behalf of every joint of their body. And he said, one salat of the duha, two rak'ahs of the duha prayer covers all that. Covers all that. Do extra dhikr. Dhikr is the second thing. Dhikr means the remembrance of Allah. You got, I always say this, download an app called Fortress of the Muslim. You got so many dhikr words in there that you say in different times of the day, increase them and say them. Number three, and, and probably I should have put this as number two, and that is reciting and living with the Qur'an. Ramadan is the month of the Qur'an. It is called Shahrul Qur'an. In Ramadan, Qur'an first was revealed. In Ramadan, in Laylatul Qadr, the night of power, the Qur'an was released from Lawh al-Mahfuz, the preserved tablet, and given to the angels, and then sent down to us bit by bit over 20, uh, over 26, over, uh, how long, 20, 23 years. So the Qur'an was first revealed in Ramadan, and every Ramadan, Jibreel alayhi salam would descend and recite the Qur'an to the Prophet ﷺ and get him to recite it so he can listen to it, test him. All, every single Ramadan, until the last Ramadan Rasul ﷺ lived and he said, I see my death nearing. For Jibreel had never recited the Qur'an to me in Ramadan more than once except now. He recited him twice to make sure. And this I see it nearing my death. And really that was Rasul Sallallahu the year in which he passed away Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Qur'an, it, the month of Ramadan is the Qur'an. Some people know how to recite the Qur'an perfectly. Some people can recite it with difficulty. Others, they stutter a lot with even more difficulty. And there are others who don't even know how to recite, even put a word together or a sentence together. And some of them don't know at all. So every person at their level. Here's what I'm going to advise you, brothers and sisters. Those who recite it very well, you are expected to finish the Qur'an at least once during Ramadan. Those who recite it somewhat well, try to get to the whole of it, if you can. Those who cannot, for various reasons, try your best, you know, aim for certain surahs or chapters to finish. Those who struggle with it, do whatever you can. The Prophet peace be upon him said, the person who recites the Qur'an and finds it and struggles with reciting it, they have double the normal reward because of your effort. And this is an encouragement to learn how to read the Qur'an better. As for those who are, say, new to Islam, don't know Arabic, they haven't had the opportunity, again, you are not out of the picture. You can memorize even Al-Fatiha and recite that by heart. If you know a short surah, recite it by heart. You know, if you recite, Qul Allahu Ahad, three times, it equals the entire Qur'an, for example. So recite what you can. Why don't you recite Al-Fatiha, if that's the only one you know, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, a hundred times during the day. That's a lot of letters. And for every letter that you recite, you get ten hasanat. And Allah, Rasul Sallallahu said, Wallahu yudha'ifu liman yasha. Allah will increase and multiply whoever He wills. You recite it with your heart with it, you get 70, up to 70, up to 10, up to, up, sorry, from 10 up to 70. Hasanat for every letter, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi said, I am not saying Alif, Lam, Mim is one letter. I am saying literally, Alif is a letter, Lam is a letter, Mim is a letter. So if you say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, who can do the calculations how many letters there are in just that one verse? Hmm? A lot, right? A lot of letters. For the sake of time, if you were to calculate how many letters there are in there, multiply that by 10 minimum, and that is the reward of saying it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may give you multiples up to 70 for each letter. Can you imagine? Just reciting the Qur'an in itself, even if what you have memorized, in itself is an act of worship, even if you don't understand what you're reciting. But of course, grab a good translation of the meaning of the Qur'an. One that I recommend is Maududi's Tafhim al-Qur'an, or anyone that tickles your fancy or you can uh, relate to it very well, recite it and inshallah it'll help you.
The most important thing, brothers and sisters, you find a verse that you can relate to and understand. If it's a commandment or prohibition or an advice, try to practice that this Ramadan. For example, you're reading from Surah Al-Hujurat, whether you are reading the translation of the meaning and it says, and it says, uh, Ya amanu min al O oh, you who have believed, avoid much of your speculations and suspicions about others. Meaning don't follow rumors and speculations. Don't even say to yourself, man, I'm so experienced. I know when someone says something, what it means, and I know this person. Don't do that. Allah says, avoid much of your suspicions. Even some of your suspicions are sinful. So suspecting someone of something, keep it for yourself. Don't act on it. And don't talk. So this is an ayah in the Quran, for example. Are you going to do that in Ramadan, for example? Busy yourself with worship, ya akhi. Stop looking at people. Look at yourself. That's the thing about Ramadan, focusing on yourself. Curiosity, trying to find out secrets and private affairs of other people. Who's got, ma- who, you know, what's, what's that couple doing? Um, I wonder how they live their life. I wonder this, I wonder that. Stop asking about people's affairs and worry about your own. These are some things to increase in Ramadan. Maybe you want to work on your tongue. This Ramadan, inshallah, I'm going to avoid the gossip that I usually do. I'm going to avoid lying because every time I talk to someone, I've got this low self-esteem. You might say to yourself, I want to always talk about myself. So these are the types of things. Number four is sadaqah. Give in charity. And number five, general character. So I repeat them. Five main activities in Ramadan. Extra prayers, Quran, dhikr, sadaqah, improving your character. My brothers and sisters, Ramadan and fasting has an effect on some people more than others. Some people come out of this school, we call it a school of Ramadan, this training, a better person in their character, even if they've improved on one or two things. Others come out with less, and then others with nothing. And I'll tell you something, brothers and sisters. From our experience, I I can't refer to any particular scientific articles about it, but I, I have... SubhanAllah, I went online and found a plethora of amazing literature and studies that have been done about dry fasting. Dry fasting is what we do, and that is, it means when you don't even drink water. That's called dry fasting. From dawn, from when Fajr first arrives, until sunset. It's called dry fasting. I read a plethora of literature, mashaAllah. And I always encourage my brothers and sisters really to become more scientifically literate. I've seen so many failures online with some of our Muslims go out in the open and they face people who know their science and try to bring verses of the Quran and things about fasting when they haven't really studied it. They don't know really what the scientific approach. And 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 they say it to them and they face people who know their science and they get actually, you know, they lose. They think they won. But when I'm listening, I say, man, you really stuffed up there. you got to really review. I wish Muslims can become more scientifically literate because we live in a world like that today. And if you can't, at least don't try to talk about it unless you know it or ask. Anyway, uh, lots of literature was done about the emotional and spiritual benefits of fasting. And the, the ones I go for are the ones that are peer-reviewed. I don't know if you know what that means, peer-reviewed. They're among the strongest, or at least the most uh, trusted, or, or, or um, that, these are the ones that scientists go for, peer-reviewed studies. And uh, there are studies about emotional intelligence, which really got my attention. Emotions, and I will call them also spiritual intelligence if you put your iman with it. And when you go through Ramadan, the experience is in the beginning you do feel fatigued. That's because the body is shocked. And so your blood pressure goes down, especially if you're not drinking, especially if it's a hot day. Your blood sugar goes down. And so you do get a headache as a result of lack of glucose, lack of sugar. Two, three days, four days, your body starts to adapt. When it adapts, things start changing in your body. Your immune system starts to work. And so it starts to develop itself. And when your immune system develops itself, that second stage, 
You also still feel a little bit of tiredness, but the headache starts to go away, so it's less. In the third stage, your immune system has now begun the attack. The attack on your toxins that are in your, inside your body, such as bacteria that's left behind, microbes, even viruses that are left behind, something called um, uh, cytokines. I don't know if you know what that is, but they are you know, chemicals that your immune system, that is a message with your immune system when it goes to fight off infections in your body, but then they stay there and they become toxic and becomes chronic. The immune system starts to eat those away. And with your fasting, you are starving them as well. So you go through this process where your body starts to adapt. Subhanallah, by about, by about the last 10 days of Ramadan, your body is so adapt to it, to fasting, your energy levels balance out and you feel you can do more. Through our experience, we see, and obviously it's different from every person to another, your health situation. When the last 10 days come, what did the Prophet ﷺ say to do? Increase or decrease? Increase. And Allah knows, and His Messenger Wasallam knows, that the body has adapted now, and the energy levels are a little bit better. And so the last 10 nights, get yourself into it. And really do see that happening with us, alhamdulillah. And that's why I think why at the end of the 10 nights, our energy levels are better. And so we go back to fighting about the moon sighting. <laughs> and before Ramadan, our energies are high, we fight about the moon sighting. And then we think, okay, it's depleted, we're tired, we're fatigued. And when you're fatigued, your emotional intelligence is better. Why? If you do do it for the, for the, for the right reasons. You start to tame yourself. You know that fight you had with your wife, or with your husband, or with your children, or with your parents, or with your neighbor, or with that person who cut you off on the street, or that person who's um, not moving and you want to beep your horn and swear at them, or at the shopping center, carts are in front of you. You know, in Ramadan, that's going to increase. Especially in the first few days. Especially when? When the anxiety hits right before Maghrib. And you're still out and there's traffic. It's like something's really terribly going to go wrong if you don't make it exactly by Maghrib to have that first bite. <laughs> Subhanallah. But if you can change that mindset a little bit and prepare yourself from now and say, you know what, see what I do there? I looked at last Ramadan, these are the things I was doing wrong. This time, I am not going to lose myself. I am not going to lose my patience if I'm late to an iftar, if, if my family made me late or whatever, I'm going to take my time. And I'm going to have maybe a bottle of water in my car or a couple of dates. I'll break my fast simply and inshallah eat. And I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters. Your emotional intelligence starts getting better and stronger and you have stronger control over yourself if you can resist and get better while you are fasting. Just like when you shock your muscle, it grows because you got it used to strong resistance and it gets stronger after that. And how, how, much, how, how proud do you feel about yourself? And same with your character, inshallah ta'ala. My brothers and sisters, I go on to the health benefits and then your questions. Now, as you know, my background is science, so I like talking about the scientific aspects. And the reason why I want to talk about it is because we do live in a Western society. And because on, we're on social media a lot, now there are a lot of non-Muslims and people who try to find problems in Islam and Ramadan and fasting and say, you people are crazy, look at you, you fast and you get dehydrated. Surely that's bad. This is silly to fast. But then we look and we think, hold on a minute. There are more than one billion, there are more than one, uh, nearly two billion Muslims around the world. At least three quarters of them fast every year. And we've been doing it for 1,400 years. Come on. You know, where are the people who are dying of fasting? Where are the people who are getting dehydrated and ending up in the graves? No, we don't hear these things. Alhamdulillah, Muslims are thriving. So it's not fasting, it's other factors. So it's a pretty silly response for someone to say something without thought. So let's have a look at some of the peer-reviewed literature and studies that we found. And I like taking information, if you want, from a place called NCBI, which is the National Center for Biotechnology Information, and also from Science Direct, which is a peer-reviewed peer literature. And I found many articles. One is called Dawn to Dusk, Dry Fasting Decreases Circulating Inflammatory Cytokines, which are pro-inflammations, in subjects with increased body mass index. Body mass index, BMI, is just another word for um, a measurement of how much fat you have and how much low fat you have um, that may lead to health problems. And this is peer reviewed in 2024. So, you know, people are talking about this. You've got another one which uh, 
says the effects of daytime dry fasting on hydration, glucose metabolism, and all of them concluded that there is no harm on a person from dehydrate from any um, effects of dehydration because of fasting. Every single one of these articles said something good about it. Alhamdulillah. And I'll tell you what, uh, this is interesting. Brothers and sisters, if you want to have a good health benefit, follow the sunnah. Follow the sunnah. Wallahi, it is amazing. And the literature about it is amazing. Number one, Rasul told you to spend time in suhoor. And he said something. He said, Inna tasahharu, fa inna fis suhuri baraka. Have your suhoor. Suhoor is the time that you eat before what? Before fajr. Not at 1 a.m. later, later, before fajr. And he said, Akhiru suhoor. Delay your suhoor. Some people take it literally. They say, delay my suhoor to the last minute before the adhan. No, he's saying delay as in take your time, wake up earlier, but do it towards the end, like closer to fajr. And tasahharu, have a good suhoor. Fa'inna fi suhoori baraka. In suhoor there is baraka. Now in English we say baraka is what? Blessings. But the meaning of the word literally in Arabic baraka means when something yabruk. Yabruk means it lasts, it stays. What stays? In other words, have suhoor, for in suhoor there is a lasting good effect that stays with you. And that is why we say, donate from your wealth, it will have baraka. Earn your wealth in halal, it has baraka. Marry in halal, your marriage will have baraka. What does baraka mean? It means the goodness of it stays and lasts. It doesn't mean Allah gives you more money. It doesn't mean Allah makes you a superman. No, it means whatever goodness is in it will last. It won't run out very quickly. So in suhoor it will last. What will last? Your health. In suhoor, but you've got to have good suhoor. You've got to avoid the oily stuff, the fried stuff. You've got to avoid the sugars, right? Processed food. In suhoor and in iftar. And that's why some people don't find the health benefits or even the spiritual benefits. Because in suhoor, some don't even have suhoor. It kills them in the day. And I'll give you a little hint about nutrition. Experts, you can find this. I don't even need to. It, don't take me as a reference. You can look it up. It's all over. Expert nutritionists tell you that if you want hydration to, to retain hydration, water in your system, early in the morning, so we'll say suhoor, drink water with a pinch of Himalayan salt. If you have Himalayan salt, it's like an orange thing. It's better than the table salt, but even table salt. Put a little bit on your tongue or put it inside your water. Mix it just a little bit and drink with a little bit of salt. It retains hydration as opposed to just drinking normal water. And also electrolytes. So have it. If you don't know what electrolytes, you can, you can have them in, in... Okay, have a banana, for example. Also have some potatoes, have some eggs. These types of fruits, these, if you can get your body used to it in suhoor, inshallah, it will help you. And in iftar, do the opposite. Don't fill your stomach. Don't break it on fast and processed foods. Trust me on this one. And have a little bit. So don't fill your stomach. And Rasul Sallallahu did say that my ummah is blessed if they hurry up their iftar. Meaning, don't eat too much. And then go to your salah, pray nicely, even if you're tempted. Look, I'll tell you a little trick. Your feeling of being full, it takes your brain to give that signal completely to your stomach 15 minutes. So if you're able to eat a little bit, and I would recommend that you eat something good and filling before you pray your maghrib. Some people, they eat, they eat one date or they have a sip of water and they rush to maghrib. You're not going to be able to concentrate well in your maghrib. Take your time and spend about 5-10 minutes eating and then go and pray maghrib. Most likely in about 15 minutes, you're not going to be as hungry. And if you eat too much and then you've got to have your desserts and you've got to have your mabar fat, have your dessert. I even do it. You know, we can't, we're always tempted. But try your best to train yourself not to have too much. Otherwise, it defeats the purpose. Some people, they do that. And then after Aisha, they go and eat more. That's another good way. But just eat healthy, inshallah, as much as you can. So, brothers and sisters, this is the barakah. Finally, uh, the way that your fasting affects your body is that uh, there are these, as I told you, these um, cells that come out of your immune system. What they do is if they stay long in your body, those cytokines, they become inflammatory. They, they, they cause you inflammation inside your body, so toxic. And when you fast, you, 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 you starve them and they die out. So 
you, you actually flush out tox toxins from your body. The other thing that fasting does for you, there's a cell called macrophages. Have you ever heard of macrophages? So these all, um, macrophages, what they do is uh, consider them like a rubbish bag, like the rubbish truck. It comes, it's a big cell, and it attacks bacteria, viruses, and microbes. And literally it takes them and throws them out of your body. They stay in your body for a long time. SubhanAllah, it, it incites them, increases them. Another one that it increases is something called um, uh, uh, microbiomes. Microbiomes is named name for good bacteria in your body. Good bacteria in your body helps regenerate uh, damages in your other cells and in your other organs. And uh, they live very long, so you can't starve them. And they, they help you against the risk of infection. It also increases the resistance to stress. A lot of us stress a lot, and it's bad for your well-being. Did you know that when you fast, it reduces your stress and it helps you to resist stress? I mean, figure that out. Even when you look at our behavior, if you're hungry, you've got no energy or time to bother with little things. There are things that when, we're, when we've eaten, we start making trouble with and stresses us out. When you're hungry, there are, imagine, remember, how many things do we, we can't be bothered with? unless you're satisfied. So it, there's a resistance to stress, and it also has an antioxidation, meaning it fights oxidized stuff. What, what is oxidized? They're basically unstable molecules inside your body. Again, let's call them toxins, and they're also called free radicals. They're the stuff that lingers around in your body that does you no good except, you, except does you harm, and uh, it leads to cell and tissue damage. And what happens is that when you fast, you have an antioxidation. So it kills them off. And finally, there's something called autophagy, which is basically when you fast, your body recycles itself. The cells die and it recycles them. And when it recycles them, they become more stronger and more immune and better. And that's why you feel yourself revitalized. Now, some people, they say to me, well, you know, um, I don't feel it that much. That's because you haven't fasted right. Your diet is terrible. In fact, you put on more weight because your diet is terrible. Number two, the Sahabas used to train fasting before Ramadan came so that they can pass the headaches and the fatigue and the body is already adapted to fasting. So they get the benefit through our fasting. That's why you feel that they've got more energy than us. And when you finish Ramadan, what did the Prophet tell you to do? Try and fast which? Another six days of shawwal quickly. Why does it tell you follow it up quickly? Because your body, number one, is adapted to it already. You have the energy. You can fast it and take advantage of those uh, rewards, inshaAllah ta'ala. Finally, brothers and sisters, Ramadan and fasting, remember, it is about spirituality. It is about connecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is about our worship, about improving ourselves, our character to be better, inshaAllah ta'ala. And Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did say when he climbed the mimbar one time, and they heard him say the famous hadith, you all know it, Ameen, Ameen, Ameen. They said to him, Ya Rasulullah, why did you say Ameen three times? He said, Jibreel alayhi salam came to me and he made dua for three things. Number one, he said, may his nose be rubbed in dust. In other words, he is truly a loser. Whoever reaches, uh, whoever lives to see his parents grow old in age and he's still alive and still, and still, he could not enter paradise because of them. And number two, a person whom my name is mentioned in front of them and did not make, they did not say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or peace be upon him, meaning who am I to them? And number three, a person who enters into Ramadan and Ramadan finishes and they come out the other side and still their sins have not been forgiven. So that's a great loser who gets to there. My brothers and sisters, I think inshallah all of you and all of us will have that opportunity and we're all, alhamdulillah, on the right path. And we anticipate to reap the benefits of Ramadan. هذا wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. I promised you something that I, you, if you have questions, but I see that there's only, what, about five minutes or ten minutes? Can we have ten minutes? The mu'adhin will, will give me another five minutes. All right, brothers and sisters, you know, part of me was deliberate in trying to not give you too much time for questions. Because some questions could put me in trouble with Ramadan, I know that. Go ahead, brothers and sisters, if you have any questions about fasting Ramadan. Nuh, yes. Uh, you shifty. 
He goes to me, when's Ramadan? Wallahi, I don't know. It's either Sunday or Monday, I think. Yes. What advice would you give to the stop point? Have life a lot more. Before I... Serve them more creepingly. Brother is asking, how do you motivate someone who you love to go to the mosque and pray and, and do good deeds in Ramadan? All you, all you are is a reminder. Just mention it to them. And that's it. Then you go and let them watch you. That's all. Rasul was like that. You cannot force it upon them. You are a warner and a reminder. That's all. Remind them but with kindness and goodness. And with a smile. And don't pressure them too much. And then you look after yourself inshallah. You never know what happens around you just by observing you. Yes brother. And yeah. Naam? Intention. Yeah, there, look, there are some things I left out because everyone knows them already. So, brother is asking about the intention. The intention for fasting Ramadan is part of the pillar of it being accepted. And that's a good question. Some people misunderstand this. They think that they have to make the intention every night for the next following day. And that if you don't make the intention, then you can't fast. No. The intention is done the, the night before Ramadan. So you make the intention. How do you make the intention? By having the intention. There's nothing specific you have to say. There's no particular thought process you have to go through. It's just that you already believe in Ramadan. You intend to fast Ramadan. In fact, the moment you heard about Ramadan, you already have the intention. So all of us right now already have that intention. The only thing is that we have to maintain that intention until the night of Ramadan. Just maintain it. So that means not having the intention is almost impossible. You'd have to leave Islam or you'd have to secretly say, I don't even want to fast. But otherwise, we all have the intention already. Maintain it until the night before and that's it. That's for the whole month you have the intention. You don't have to every night do some ritual. So that's easy. But let's say that you had the intention and you found out the next day that it was not Ramadan. Let's say somehow it was proven to you, nobody cited the crescent. Then you break your fast and you intend for the next day. What if you did not intend because nobody fast, nobody saw the crescent and you happened to sleep early because you had work the next day or something? The next day you find out everybody's fasting, but you did not make the intention. What's the answer to that? Fast or not fast? Fast. fast. You fast. Why? Because your intention was, if it is Ramadan, I'm fasting. And the moment you say the Shahada, you already believe in Ramadan. So you did not deliberately not make the intention. You made that intention because of not fasting, because you thought it wasn't Ramadan. But if it is, you continue fasting. There is a very minor view of some scholars, minor, but it's not the majority, and it doesn't have much evidence. It says that Fast the day, but make it up just in case. I say to you, Islam is easy, and the majority of the scholars said no. You just continue to fast it, so long as you haven't eaten anything in the morning. Otherwise, if you hadn't made the intention because you thought it was a Ramadan, and then you find that it was Ramadan, but you had eaten, then it's better to make up that day, but you have to continue fasting. And yes. If somebody, that's a good question. If somebody deliberately goes out of their way during Ramadan to travel 80 kilometers or above just to break their fast, that's a sin. That's haram. Because you're trying to beat the system and trying to trick Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is not tried. <laughs> Listen, here is a rule that, that you can remember. A rule that scholars told us. من حج ليأخذ لم يجز ومن أخذ ليحج جاز. The principle is, if you do Hajj because you want to make a profit out of it, it's sinful. But if you took money in order to do Hajj, then it's permissible. Same. If I went on a travel, 90 k's. In order to break my fast, it's haram. But if I went on a travel because I have to, 
then I have the exemption of breaking my fast. So it comes down to your intention. No. In that case, would it be better to fast or not fast? This is your concern. If you intended to go on a travel just to break your fast. Yeah. Okay. So if you're actually traveling with the right intention, is it better to break your fast or keep fasting? Well, that's a difference of opinion among the scholars. You don't feel tired. No, no, we can't say because you don't feel tired or whatever. That's all up to you, really. There's, we follow text, ya We follow what the Quran and Sunnah says. Now, if you don't feel tired, a person can be on travel and not feel tired at all. But still got the exemption because Allah SWT says, safar. Some people think that it's actually a good question. Some people do think they say, well, you know, we, we travel now in beautiful airplanes. We sit in a five-star hotel. Why should you break your fast? No, 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 no. That's not what the Qur'an said. The Qur'an said, whoever is on travel or is sick, other days. Why do we have to restrict it and make it hard? Allah said so. Not, there is nothing. Rasul Sallallahu went on travel and sometimes he was at, at ease and he broke his fast. It was not a problem at all. So uh, Islam is yusr. It's easy. But if you went on travel to 80 or 90 case, is it better to break your fast? Well, uh, in the Hanbali school, which I've studied, uh, and uh, the evidence that they say, uh, Rasul Zalem said, Inna Allah yuhibbu, and uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves that his concessions be taken. So in their, in their opinion, based on this hadith, they say, well, if Allah has given you a concession, use the concession. But then the others, they said, no, uh, if there's no real need, then better not to take the concession. The bottom line is, it's up to you. The bottom line is up to you, yeah, without getting too technical. The fidya? Good question. So let's say somebody is terminally ill or chronically ill or old and too weak to fast. You've got diabetes where you need your insulin. You've got a condition where you have to take medication or you're too weak. Then what do you do about that? You cannot make up those days because you don't know when you're going to be better. Instead, you have to pay a fidya. For fidya tun ta'am miskin. Then you just feed one needy or poor person per day. So 29 days or 30 days that we're fasting, that person just sends their wealth, their money through a charity organization uh, to people to feed a poor person for each day. That's it. And the amount of money you send, so the idea is to feed. So if, you, if you're living, say, in Lebanon, where I'm from, and you have poor people living around you, you can invite them or you can send food to them for a meal and you don't have to pay anything. But if you're living in Australia and you want to get the meal to someone who is in need, you can pay through a charity organization, depending on what one meal costs at the place that you're sending it. If I send it to, uh, say, uh, I don't know how much it is in Malaysia, what is a, a common meal in Malaysia? Uh, Are you from Singapore? In Singapore, what's a common meal in Singapore? $10. So I send $10. What's a common meal in Australia? Something, a nice good meal? We're not talking about five-star hotel um, restaurants. Thirty dollars. We're talking about. Oh, well. It's talking about a wagyu, a wagyu steak. Thirty bucks. Fellas, if that's what you eat here, at thirty bucks your meal. God help your wife. Oh, well, she's very lucky. You're going to buy her a whole big meal, inshallah. Then it's thirty dollars if that's what you eat of a meal. But uh, but a common meal here in Australia to feed a person a kebab sandwich would be what? 20? 20 bucks. 20 bucks per day. So depending on the livelihood of people. Uh, well, I feel bad that the sisters couldn't ask questions. I'm very sorry. I don't know how we're going to do it. Maybe you can throw papers across. Tawdal Kabud. Children, they will And that's such a bad night. I don't know. The art heights of the last days of... Now, many people believe that they are not going to ask the 27th. Okay, brother is asking about Laylat al-Qadr and to search for it. How about inshallah, if you come to the mosque, you'll see me here inshallah. When Laylat al-Qadr comes inshallah, we'll talk about that because that's a long topic. When is it? How should you look for it? We'll talk about it inshallah later on because Aisha now is, uh, has arrived. Uh, one more question and we'll go to Aisha. Yes. From a sister? Okay, good. Even is not able to pray fast during the fasting days. Then what do you recommend? If a woman is not able to fast or pray in the last 10 days of Ramadan, that's it. Her intention was there. She still gets the reward as if she prayed and fasted. 
And all she does is make up the days that she couldn't fast and does not have to make up the salat. Otherwise, do everything else. Recite Quran by heart. Make dhikr. Make dua. Do good deeds. Give in charity. Uh, teach your children. Uh, be good in your home. Be good to your parents, your neighbors, your friends. Do all acts of goodness. All of that still continues. And another question. Maybe sisters. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, if uh, someone takes medicine, yeah. not to have a uh, monthly sub A. Oh, brother is asking for sisters. Some sisters like to be extra religious, so they take a pill to prevent their menstrual cycle during Ramadan. Allah, ya akhi, look. Is it better or not? I can't say better or not. I don't know. I don't know. But what I do know is that look at the harm versus the benefit. Ask a doctor and say, okay, is there any harm that this pill can bring me? What kind of harm can come to me? If there is any harm in it, it's better not to take it and to break your fast and take Allah's concession. And Allah has fed you and he gave you a concession and gives you the same reward. You know, I, I personally, I never like people to go out of their way to try and be extra religious. Really. Unless you need to. Like if you want to take it for other reasons to make your life a little bit easier for some reason, that's a different story. But just so that you can fast, just so you can make your worship in your mind better, don't, don't do that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you ease. Use the ease and Allah will give you those rewards and make up other days inshallah. All right. Jazakumullah khair, my brothers and sisters. Sorry I didn't have enough time for questions. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.